Dr. Stephen Greer. Dr. Greer, thank you for coming on. I am happy to be with you today. Okay, now I think what we need to do uh, before we unpick the various strands of your work is just to get a handle on you and who you are because uh, your career did not begin as a man questing after scientific answers like this. You're a medical doctor. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a trauma emergency doctor, so I ran a, uh, an emergency department for many years in uh, uh, North Carolina and... Uh, so I, at one point, was chairman of emergency medicine there. And, you know, in America, it's its own specialty. It's, you know, shooties and stabbings and car wrecks and burns and all the all that kind of thing. And uh, while I was doing that, I got involved in looking into this question, which I'd had an interest in since I was a child, of what are these things that people call UFOs and why is it being kept secret? And one thing led to another, and well, here I am. So, but uh, if, interestingly, when I was about eight or nine years of age, I saw a silver, a seamless disc. It had no moving parts. It had no rivets. It was astonishingly clear middle of the day with some friends in my neighborhood, and I knew I had seen something extraordinary because it didn't move away. It just kind of dematerialized and disappeared right in front. Uh, of us. And of course, my parents said, oh, yeah, well, sure, whatever. But at the time, my uncle was working on the lunar module, which I don't know for those who were too young to know what that is, the m funny looking machine that we built to put the first man on the moon. Yeah, made, made of what you call aluminum foil, what we call aluminum foil. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very fragile thing. My uncle works, uh, worked on that as a senior um, aerospace engineer at. Uh, Grumman, which is now Northrop Grumman, the second biggest aerospace company in the world, uh, out the, next to Lockheed Martin. And so uh, I had a great interest in space, and of course I was a young child when he was working on that. But uh, nevertheless, you know, I, I, I knew I had seen something space-related and something that was really extraordinary, and it ignited a lifelong interest in, in uh, these matters. And uh, as I began to look into it further, I began to realize not only were, were these objects real, but the secrecy was based on something that no one had figured out. And um, Well, you, you had a special connection, obviously, through your uncle. Um, did you tell him what you'd seen? And if you did, what did he make of it? Oh, yes, I told him. And uh, in fact, to the day he passed away, which was two weeks after Neil Armstrong did in 2012, uh, he was very supportive of the work I'm doing. Right, so he allowed for the prospect and the possibility that indeed we may not be alone, even though he was working on our exploratory effort uh, down here. Well, he knew. He knew we weren't alone, and, and he knew that it would do. I mean, you know, he was a very smart man. You know, the irony is, is that, you know, while the, the, the media relegates the subject to the rubbishing in the tabloids, as your Lord Hill Norton famously said, in an interview we have of him up yes. on our website that people who want to look at his and other interviews can go to uh, SeriousDisclosure.com, serious like the star system, S-I-R-I-U-S, Disclosure.com, it's all one word. And what you'll see are, are we have dozens of these sort of people who come out and said, oh, well, this is taken very seriously in these quarters. And what I have found is that when I've done briefings with people at the Pentagon or the U.S. Senate or the CIA, it's actually taken very seriously, but it's, you know, it's portrayal in the media has always been that it's just nonsense. And well, but, you know, high ranking people uh, in a position to know are not laughing. They're taken incredibly seriously. I think you're dead um, right about this, Dr. Greer, because over here in the UK, I, I, I think, you know, I think uh, maybe Emily, who set that up, this up, uh, told you that I work as a broadcast journalist. That's what I do. And right. I always think that we're starting to make baby steps forward and take this a little more intelligently and uh, treat it a little more as grown-ups. And then every so often we get a story in the newspapers that shows we really haven't progressed at all. Well, what people don't understand is that beginning in 1953, the CIA, and I have a document that proves this, made a deliberate effort to engage in what they call psychological warfare to portray the whole matter is nonsense. And in fact, they even engaged Disney Studios, which, as you may know, did a lot of work for the Pentagon and the intelligence community in World War II. And they engaged Disney Studio to make ridiculous cartoons about little green men and this and that and the other thing. And this was, this was actually done with malice aforethought 
to create a spin on the subject to this day makes it sort of topic non grata. You know, if there's a persona non grata, there this is the topic non grata that you cannot speak about. And from what I read, Walt Disney was a patriot, so he would play ball with that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he was in the back pocket of the intelligence community and the uh, later the CIA all the way until the day he passed away. So what a lot of people don't realize is that the connection between Hollywood and the intelligence community has always been very intimate and as well as with the, the, the larger media. And so what you are left with is, is a very faint idea of what's really out there. But the irony is, we put on this massive press conference at the National Press Club, um, and uh, we had uh, 22 uh, top-secret military whistleblowers and witnesses to events uh, and material dealing with UFOs, extraterrestrial intelligence. It was, at the time, the largest event that had ever been held at the National Press Club, and it was the largest event up to that point that had ever been seen on the Internet live. And we had, you know, so much uh, support for that. But the major media people got to me later and said, you know, we started getting calls saying, don't cover this too much. From and whom? Started, hey, Who was from, making the calls? From the intelligence community. Really? Now, this is yeah. very, this is amazing that you say this because I can remember Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM talking about this. I was listening over here online. I'd become hooked and addicted to all of this. I'd always been interested in these topics anyway. And I thought, this is it then. This event is going to be the one that blows the lid off it. And this is the one that the mainstream media cannot ignore. And nobody was more surprised than I was surprised and of course I'm a very small cog I was working for the mainstream media but as one person what can I do alone it was pretty largely ignored over here an event of that size and I found that as you must have found it enormously disappointing well no I didn't uh, I wasn't disappointed because I didn't have expectations to the contrary in other words by the time I did that event in 2001 I had already been the go-to guy to brief the CIA director for President Clinton, the sitting CIA director, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the head of the uh, intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, frankly, members of your royal family, who I won't name. So th the point I'm making is that it did not at all surprise me that there was an infrastructure in, in place to spin or take down the buzz. Now, what you have to understand also, the first hour of that event was electronically jammed so that no signals could leave the National Press Club building in Washington, D.C. Really? The, the, yes, the contractor that had the job and, and hosts all the things for the National Press Club at that time, they were called Connect Live. They also hosted the Pentagon's Internet events as well as CNN. They said they had never seen anything like it. The numbers of people online trying to see it used up at that time every T1 line in Washington. He said They said, but the first first hour of it, nothing could leave that building. And of course, I had intelligence sources who told me the night before that the building was crawling with, with um, operatives and that probably the event would be disrupted. And so they put it on a one-hour delay, but nevertheless, it did get out. But as, as major media started to cover it, in fact, I heard uh, one uh, NBC um, uh, anchor saying, my God, this is like the real X-Files, but it's the real thing. They started to report it and then it vanished. And this is something we've seen many times. Of course, we knew this was going to happen because in 1991, we had gotten a document that had been, during the first Bush administration, described, and I have it up on my website, those of you who want. All this stuff is up there for people to see. We have a massive website, as I've said, Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, Disclosure.com. But we put this document up, and it's a document that describes that the CIA and other intelligence communities have people at every major network and every magazine and every on wire service uh, and broadcast network to alter, change, or stop stories. And I'm quoting. Now, when you read this the, the CIA document, it's chilling. Now, it got declassified, and then it got reclassified after I released it, but we still have it. Huh. And what's interesting is the naivete of the public. You know, what, what always surprises me is that people were surprised by anything that Snowden revealed. I thought that was just 
everyone would know that. Of course, they're listening to every single phone call and email. I was shocked that people were going, we're shocked. Uh, and I'm going, really? You know, but what's interesting, people have to feign shock in Washington. So the president has to act surprised when, you know, for goodness sakes, I mean, it's been very many years since there was any privacy. You know, the head of Lockheed Skunk Works said before he died, Ben Rich, he said, uh, quote, there are no private conversations anywhere on earth. Mm. I think a lot of us knew this stuff was going on. And yes, we saw right. little tips of the iceberg, like uh, newspapers getting hold of confidential conversations from the royal family and stuff like that, which were trotted out over here for titillation. But right. to recently discover the extent that uh, the NSA has been uh, partaking of our business, I think has come as a shock to a lot of members of the public. It's certainly not the fact that it was happening, but the scale of it is the shocker. Yeah, well, you know, here here's a note, something that I have from sort. You have to understand, I have over 550 people who who work now or have worked in the CIA, NSA, Pentagon. What, why are they uh, talking to you if you if you have these people who are connected to you? What, why do you think they're they're they're, they're 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 they are true patriots and they're shocked and appalled that this nonsense is going on, and they know that this is the biggest secret in the history of of the human race. They know that what the reasons for the secrecy have nothing to do with our national security, but with a, an oligarchy, a kleptocracy of people who want to maintain the, the status quo of the macroeconomic order. And, and this is what, you know, when the Honorable Paul Hillier and I first met, I, this is what he and I first talked about, the Minister of Defense of, uh, Great, of, of Canada. And, and, and he, 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 when he read my materials and he understood that it's, the, it's a science and technology story, that when you see one of these so-called UFOs, it's a totally inappropriate name, by the way. They're not unidentified, and they don't fly. But um, so they're objects. The O part is the only part of UFO that's legitimate. The rest of it was concocted after they knew that they were either extraterrestrial or the man-made prototypes based on studying so-called anti-gravity technologies but basically the source of energy that are making those things move and where an object can be at one point in the sky and in an instant later be 40 miles away on radar which we have radar tapes to prove by the way this is not something you can do with a jet engine so you're dealing with a whole new level of energy propulsion physics that has been kept secret since the, since at least the 40s and 50s. Well, in Why? fact, one of the things you say, well, certainly one of the things I've read about you uh, attributed to you is that uh, the NSA itself was formed initially to cover up Roswell. Well, uh, you, yes, and also the CIA was formed immediately after that happened in 1947. If you look to the date of the formation of the CIA and the Air Force forming separately from the Army Air Force, which is what it was in World War II, it was that singular event. When they realized that they had materiel that would advance what they already knew was going on in, in high physics. Now, remember, a lot of people think that these things that are man-made that look like UFOs that Lockheed has and my uncle's old company has, Northrop Grumman, and they do have them, by the way. Um, they're very classified aircraft. They're not acknowledged. In fact, they come, come into the category an unacknowledged special access project, or USAP, which is what we go into in our, my film. And what these USAPs are, these unacknowledged projects are, is that they do not get acknowledged to anyone who is not in them. So it doesn't matter if you're a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. They will not tell you about it. So it this is what they call need to know. Yes, but it also doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States. Really? Now, oh, no. can because I just? Can, I'm sorry for interrupting. I do apologize, but I just yeah, want no. to to just bring in one important point, and it winds us back just a few minutes. And I I should have interrupted you before about this, but no, please go ahead. When you said that you are invited by very very important people to brief them, and some of whom you uh, you cannot even go close to naming. Um, why do they, if there is this enormous cover-up going on, and it is sensed at every level that there might be, I don't understand the mechanics of how these people call you in to brief them. Why do they want you to brief them? Well, it's, for example, let's go back historically, back in the 90s, when there were, everyone may, remembers that we had a, a guy named President Clinton, who was our president for eight years. His CIA director, when he first became CIA director, uh, was 
asked by the president to look into this, into UFOs. And we have this acknowledged not only from uh, Webster Hubble, who was third in command of justice, but, but his 